Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Pulpedia Show, October the 7th. It's me, Kim Kita, and I've got the esteemed co-host, Destiny. Hello. All right, and today's Off the Pole section, we are going to talk about differences in the way that people design pole dance choreography, right? So there's multiple reasons to design pole dance choreography. Most of the time, people would either design it for a show, a showcase, um, you know, a competition, maybe a recital at your local pole studio, um, or maybe you're coming up with something on your own just because it makes you happy to design things and have stuff in your back pocket, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, I've, I've been really interested. So I, I had to design a choreography recently. And I've always been interested in the way that other people's brains work when they design things. Because as a teacher, when you start to teach people choreography, you learn that other people's brains don't necessarily pick it up the same way that you do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so some people, you know, like to learn the dance based on counts. So like one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, and eight. And then most notably what I've seen in the pole world from teachers that I've learned from is we don't call it out by, you know, counts. We call it out by moves, right? Like mm. right hand up, left across, step around, right? And so the beats are there and they make sense, but you're not calling it out on counts, right? That makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's similar to how I've learned a lot of choreography. Yeah, and so... Um, Destiny has obviously performed in a competition once before, so let's kind of talk about how you decided what kind of choreo you were going to do, like what put you on the path to choosing like your theme, your song, your outfits. Oh man, that is that is a uh, roller coaster. Uh, I didn't know what I when I was when I when I competed, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was talked out of two different categories. So I'm like, well, well, if I'm not doing those, then I guess I'm gonna go with this category. And it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I was, it was very out of place. Um, I just, I worked with my instructor at the time to actually come up with a choreo because I just felt lost. It was the first real choreo I was putting together um, that actually mattered. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to go through, um, some some sort of structure but as far as when it came to the actual moves I had no idea what I was doing uh as some background uh I like to work with a lot of structure a lot of let's write things down let's make sure I know it because I'm not going to remember it verbally I'm very very kinesthetic okay um so I tried to do like a three two one structure where three is like your it's or, or two three one uh two is your second most impressive trick and then it goes to your third most impressive trick. That's the middle part, the part that, you know, everybody enjoys, but it's kind of just filler to get to the, what you want to do yeah. with the, the crowd pleaser, which is your first most impressive trick at the very end. And then you have this structure for each part of your choreo. So you have your, your static pole, your floor, your spinning pole, and you can mix and match that however you want, depending on how many times you want to go back and forth. Um, this is using PSOs, you know, you've got uh, rules of you've got to be on the pole, static yeah. pole, you've got to be on the spin pole, and then so and so. Somehow you've got to make it um, across the floor and you can't walk. Yeah, you can't just walk right on over unless you're doing a comedy routine and somehow <laughs> You've managed to add the easy part of just like, well, I'm just going to saunter on over hilariously. Yeah, I mean, I saw it happen. It worked really well for the girl who did it, but <laughs> it wouldn't have worked for mine. Um, but I worked with my instructor at the time to kind of, you know, go through what do I want to do? What kind of style do I like? What feels right? Um, so we marathoned that. And a lot of it was very move name based or, or even like if you did sound effects kind of counting in your head mm -hmm. with like uh now you slide across the floor like this and you go <laughs> like I do that <laughs> and that's how I kept mental note because a lot of those floor work names don't have a name <laughs> no they don't <laughs> <laughs> um 
Um, and it just kind of all came together. I would like when I came down, when I when I came up with something I really liked and I wanted to keep, I would video it, I would record it, and then I would write it down. I never reference those videos again, but for my own like mental sanity, yeah. I, I needed it to be recorded. <laughs> Just in case, because if you don't record it, you're never going to remember it. And if you do record it, you don't need them. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would also time up my moves to the timestamps in the song specifically, because I'd go through and I'd, I'd look at, okay, well, the beat drops here at this timestamp, and then the vocals start here, the chorus starts here. Well, these are the main sections of my choreo routine. Yeah. And then I worked from those sections of, okay, well, in this section, I'll be on the pole, on the spin pole, or I'll be on the static pole. And that's how I sectioned it out to start the two, three, one structure that I talked about. Yeah. I have never heard of the two, three, one structure. That is fantastic. <laughs> um, it's a great roller coaster because you're like, ah, catch the attention. And then you're like, here's some cool stuff. Yeah, it's not the coolest shit you've seen yet, and then at the it's end, not the showstopper. Yeah, and then at the end, literally the showstopper, where you're like, "Bam! This is it. This is the coolest shit I got." And then you know you kind of that's the climax of the show, and then you rush, you know, you roll, you ride the roller coaster the rest of the way down, where you're like, "Ha ha ha!" Yeah, right? yeah. You can uh, you can thank the other Pulpedia member, Elliot, for that little tip. Elliot he used to do uh, magic in a magic shows on the side of the street and on stages and <laughs> that would make sense right because you want to draw people in with something cool give them something a little bit better or not better mm -hmm. give them something a little you know not super like boring but give them something kind substantial of that is substantial to keep them there and then they to make them want to stay to see the final big trick mm -hmm. and That's then awesome. you know you want to get tips afterwards so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I have um I've never so that's awesome that's a great way to think about that um it helped me a lot <laughs> <laughs> um when I was designing oh man okay so my students know um my style hilariously um I do not design choreo for like so this assume <laughs> that this choreo that I'm talking about is for a class and that in that class it, let's it's just say it's titled exotic right mm -hmm. there's a billion different styles of exotic there's low flow there's like slow like dripping and then there's like you know very notably like Russian exotic or something like mm -hmm. that right there's a billion different things for me to choose from for that exotic class and I don't really, there's no like set precedent or theme that I have to go for. My students know that I do not draft choreo until we are in class. I'm not <laughs> drafting it beforehand because when I started pole dancing, I would draft up choreo mm -hmm. beforehand. And, or when I started teaching pole dancing, I would make the choreo first and then I would bring it to class and always I would have to change it. It would never fail. I would have to change it to accommodate a student, which is totally fine, by the way. My choreo is not like heart stopping amazing, right? And so I would change it to fit people in class a little bit better. Maybe this is a move that I know some students are just absolutely not gonna be able to do, right? Whatever makes my body happy might not make their body feel happy as well, right? What makes mm -hmm. me feel sexy might not make these people feel sexy in the same body. So I would always change it. And so I've gotten to a point now where I do not, um, I do not choreograph before those classes. I really don't. Like I have a general <laughs> idea in my head, but I haven't spent like 30 minutes to an hour, like deciding on the song and the choreographing and the, no, uh, I pretty much <laughs> do it all live freestyle style. Uh, but let's, uh, I'll use my show as an example. My last show that I did was, um, the last show that I did was for a virtual circus uh, for a theater in San Francisco. Mm. And um, it was just supposed to be more of like a down to earth kind of, you know, we're alone, but we're together. So the, the title of the whole show was alone together, right? Kind of like we're two months into quarantine and it sucks and everybody misses each other, but we're together in the fact that we're alone. Also, we can talk to each other on Zoom. Or you know, <laughs> phone calls, FaceTime, whatever. 
Yeah, collective um, experiences. Yeah, so that was, so I was given a theme alone together, but that is a lot of things. That could mean all kinds of things, right? How do I, how do I personally bring this theme together with the rest of what people are doing in the show? And of course I knew I was doing pole dancing, other people were doing other apparatuses, and that's awesome. Uh, so I chose a song... I was trying to find the right song. So most of the time I start with my song, um, which some people don't prefer. Some people prefer to start with some movements maybe, or freestyling to a bunch of different songs and seeing what maybe floats their goat. Mm. I start with a song first uh, and I chose like the world keeps spinning by theory of the dead man. Right. And then I was like, Oh, the word spinning's in there. This whole thing has to be on spin pole, <laughs> which is, there you go. <laughs> three and a half minutes of spinning pole anyone who has ever done spin <laughs> pole before will know that's a long time obviously you're not spinning for the entire three minutes but it's still a really more long or time. less <laughs> yeah you're still you're still going to be taking a taking a nausea pill afterwards yes you got it. your your brain is shooken up in the jar it's gone um and so it's madness so I, I start with my song first and then um I will listen to it like a couple of times. Like there will probably be like a day where I like, listen to it on repeat. Just whatever I have time to listen to music, that's what I'm listening to on repeat. Learn every single beat to the song, all the movement, mm-hmm. like in my head. And then from there, my brain is like, these motions seem to fit well with just the music. Um, mm. And it's, I don't know how the other way to describe that. So like maybe I'm going to do a slide across the floor and then grab pirouette or something. And I'm like, Oh, and there's just mental pictures will come up and I'll be like, Oh, that's what I wanted to do. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was very similar to my experience with coming up with the actual choreo. (laughs) Yeah. Um, How do I remember the hell? How do I remember the choreo? I have no clue how I actually (laughs) remember all of this shit. It's literally just association of, after this move is this move and then everything behind that just gets completely deleted whatever Mm -hmm. i've already done it just it clears out and i make room for the rest (laughs) so when i'm learning stuff i give myself leeway on beats because it's not like there are drops and shit in songs that like i will personally be like i gotta hit that i really gotta hit that one everything else though eh like Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's okay if I don't make it there on time all the time (laughs) um and so I very much so learn and teach in the manner of hand up now at this moment or into this trick now instead of one two three and four and I have students that need me to count it out instead Mm. of just like you know hand up step up Right, so a step up for me, right, where I plant my feet and then I straighten my legs, booty goes up, and then I roll my head up. Mm-hmm. For me, that's one that's one sentence, that is. Uh, or maybe, you know, like, step, roll up, okay? But other students may be like, step, step, so one, two, booty up, three, four, head up five six right yeah that is that is definitely something i've noticed is a lot of the time if somebody's counting or needs to count they need it for the timing more than they need the association with the move Mm -hmm. um and so yes my brain doesn't function in the the timing realm because i don't think i do (laughs) there are many times where i'm like i can give myself a little leeway here with this timing like, if I take a little extra time, it's not so bad. If I go a little bit slower or if I happen to speed up too fast, like, there's movement in the way. Um, I think that pretty much everyone, you know, tries to choreograph to, uh, you know, like lyrics and stuff that they're hearing, right? I don't think that's mm-hmm. abnormal to say that people are choreographing to, no. like, the lyrics that you hear and stuff like that. Um, but I do know people who would prefer you know count wise and then i also know people who will just put on songs and will set up a quick like a camcorder and just freestyle the hell out of it until they you know are tired go back watch it keep some pieces at certain places 
freestyle until they get to that spot and then keep rolling, right? So mm-hmm. maybe instead of like a three, two, one, uh, or sorry, <laughs> two, three, one. There we go. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to count down. I was like, ha ha ha. Mm-hmm. Sequential um, way. <laughs> so maybe instead of like, you know, second, third, first, like most impressive tricks, maybe they're just like, oh, this is what makes my body feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I know somebody who who went up and completely like, did not prep their competition at all and just freestyled the moment they got on stage. Didn't know their song, randomly picked it, and then won like fourth place. And I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> that's. I think that's amazing. I do believe that PSO at one point had freestyle sections of their competitions. I think so. Yeah. Um, um, it wasn't in a freestyle. It was in exotic though. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? That's cool. That works for you, but no, thank you. I can't freestyle when I'm at home by myself. Hardly, like my mind just goes blank. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, uh, that would be a lot of stress on me personally. Like as someone who likes to prepare for things at least a little bit, that would be a lot of stress on me. Um, yeah, where I'm, you know, no. I gotta, I gotta have something prepared. I think even if I signed up for like a freestyle version of the competition, I would still prepare something. Yeah, I I went through like the the six months after my competition. I'm like, all right, I gotta do this, and I just uh, I went into every class like I'm freestyling today. I've got to, otherwise I'm never going to learn. <laughs> yeah. Um. How do you approach freestyling, right? Because freestyling is something that lots of people use in designing for their choreo, right? Because you're trying to find moves that you think maybe match up with the song if you don't already have one in your mind, um, right? So how do you go about freestyling? Uh, so as far as... There, there's two parts to freestyling, I think. And one part is you have a mental block and you're trying to figure out what move goes next. And the other part is just doing what feels good. The just doing what feels good is like you find a great, you find a great song that you just, you, can, you know you can move to. You just move, you don't really care. Um, freestyling, I found, for, for at least for me, comes when you stop putting any kind of pressure on yourself and you just move doesn't matter what it looks like Mm -hmm. in the end um so maybe like for for me I like low flow so some of it may not even be pole tricks it might just be going around the pole in different ways um and then if I'm feeling stuck and I'm not really sure what I want to do um I found a great way to get past that is to just jam to some music that I know I like it doesn't have to be freestyle worthy music um get in a mood where I feel like I can move around, I can dance, uh, and switch to what I want to freestyle to, because I'm already in that mood. I'm already in that kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. And maybe while I'm jamming, I'm looking up Instagram choreography and just scrolling through, getting inspiration and, see, and seeing like, oh, that seems neat. That seems neat. But I'm not referencing anything. I'm just kind of getting it fresh in my brain. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go to, and then I'm going to go to the hole and I'm going to try some of it out and start trying to move in a way that feels natural for sure um helping people learn how to freestyle or enhance (laughs) their freestyle is literally one of my favorite things Um, is it really (laughs) before my studio uh, before i had to close my retail location um i was hosting freestyle classes so freestyle fridays was a thing and we would come in and a couple of things that we would do is Um, some of the ways that I host freestyling classes is number one, it's gotta be people who have been polling for a little bit. Um, if you Mm -hmm. are a absolute beginner, it's very likely that you don't really, you know, have internalized like, you know, the moves that are, you know, fundamental to moving around the pole. Like you might've done a couple of spins, but it might not come second nature to you to like, just go and like do something like that. So Mm -hmm. I would have, you know, like my level two pluses, right? So you can kind of go upside down at this point. Like you're, you're really building up those strengths and stuff. And I would be like, all right, you give me a move and then you give me a move and then you give me a move, right? So give me like three moves so we can put together a combination. And that's a great way to do it in a group setting. <laughs> and so I'd be like, all right, everybody has just picked a move and none of these moves makes any sense. 
try on your own first. Don't collude. Don't collaborate. Try on (laughs) your own first to put them together in some shape, form, or fashion, right? Because people are going to connect things differently. And then if they're truly, truly stuck, I will, you know, I will show them a couple of things that I have on my mind. I'm not the end all be all. There's plenty of other ways to go about it, but it helps get the wheels turning in your head. So if someone's like, I want to do a shoulder mount and the other person is like, I want to do a ballerina. I'm like, good luck getting from one to the other. It's possible to do it for sure. Right. You can either go up you know into your shoulder mount and then you know hook into oh jesus there's a million ways to get right side (laughs) back up you can hook into your shoulder or go into your shoulder mount and then you can go into a thigh hold and you know swing yourself into one of your leg hangs come back around and you know lower yourself down come back around and throw yourself into your ballerina Mm. um or (laughs) you can start (laughs) your ballerina and if you're real crazy you can reach around and grab unfold all of your legs and then up you go right (laughs) and then it also doesn't have to be a direct transition like that's that's for transition classes (laughs) (laughs) like how do i get from this trick to this trick and so freestyling and helping people design uh even just combinations even if it's not like a choreo for a show like how do i get better at doing combinations that is something that i would work with them on um the thing that I like to do in like private lessons or maybe, and I've even done this kind of in a smaller group setting. It gets really hard. The more people you add is they pick a song. Somebody picks a song, right? And I hit play and I make you dance just for a minute. Just I'll turn Mm -hmm. the lights down low and I make you dance for a minute. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I want to see what your body is doing naturally. How do you move that makes you happy when I've given you no restrictions? Yeah. Right? And so my favorite thing is to find it's it's all my favorite thing but it's also the necessary part to find the point where people are getting stuck like you're talking about, right? Where you're like I keep coming I keep pirouetting into nothing. What mm-hmm. do I do after that, right? Ah, and then you get on Instagram and you're looking up things. <laughs> Maybe you come across something and you're like that looks like it would be really cool. Let's see if my body likes it, right? And I really like this move. And so yeah obviously the more people you add the harder it is to watch for those moments so two people three tops if you're crazy (laughs) um because most people will get stuck at least twice in a minute a minute's a really long time (laughs) i've i've had those those kind of classes where it's just like yeah freestyle for a minute that's how we're gonna start our class and they'll turn the lights down like you said and everything like that and uh at the time i was like middle intermediate to advanced intermediate classes and even then like I hadn't gone through my freestyle intensive I didn't know what to do (laughs) um and so I had a really hard time with it but I found that actually one of the best things you can do is just completely change what plane you're on so if you're just standing if you're standing to go up to a trick or if you want just drop right down into floor work like get out of the mindset of, oh, I have a pirouette, pirouette, and I don't know what to do afterwards. Well, pirouette, and then maybe I want to drop into a a twerk. Like, yeah. (laughs) Like that just, it releases whatever mental block you get in your head. So you're no longer like, well, now I'm upright, so I have to stay upright until I get to a certain point, right? And then I'm going to move. Um, That is also one of the games that I make them play. um, (laughs) Oh, yeah. Is, yeah, so... Um, one of the things that, so this is something I learned from my previous head instructor in Vegas. Um, what she would do is we had eight poles and they were kind of staggered. And so, uh, you would be, you'd have two poles to play between depending on how many people were in class, but you'd have pretty much two poles to play between and Mm -hmm. one spin, one static. And she would say, you know, she would level things. So level one is like laying flat on the ground. Like, you know, you can grind, you can wiggle your arms and legs. Level two, on your knees. Level three, standing up. Level four, something upside down. Mm. and so she would just randomly call it out she if you're she's like level one and she'd give you about 15 seconds of level one like just enough to get you moving and she'd be like three and you've got to figure out how to get from the floor laying down <laughs> to standing up doing something mm. um so i i think that your plane idea is 
uh, amazing, right? You don't have to have someone calling it out to do you. But if you are stuck, mm. go somewhere else and come back. Yeah, it helps a lot more than you'd think it does, actually, because like I said, like most of freestyle, whenever you get stuck, it is a mental block. So long as you've been through the beginner classes, you have that foundation of moves that you know, you know, these things, mm-hmm. you know, what, what you're going to do, you know, basically how to move. And it's just a matter of stringing it all together on the fly, on the spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all of these things, like obviously everything that we're talking about with freestyling helps with choreo drafting, right? Because very rarely mm-hmm. do you sit down with a pen and paper or like your, you know, your phone and you're like, well, I'm going to do this one to this one to this one to this one to this one. And then I'm going to do this, this, and this. <laughs> I don't know of anybody, that person could be out there, don't get me wrong, but I don't personally know of anybody that would sit down and write all of this stuff out and then go do it. Like, you're going to test this stuff. Yeah. To whatever song you're doing or, you know, whatever. You're going to test it a little bit. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, in the meantime, you're going to be like, eh, maybe not. And then you're going to try and freestyle. So designing your choreography, freestyle comes in heavily, right? And so all of these methods of learning to freestyle and, you know, how to get unblocked. So like Destiny is saying, like, change the plane, go somewhere else, get it, go, come back later, go up if you're down, go down if you're up, right? Do something that is not what you're doing right now. Yeah. Um, Right. So that method. And then, um, you know, you could always reach out to peers and be like, give me your favorite tricks and let me see if I can move in between them. Right. Um, Or come up with your own three favorite tricks. And how do I get from one to the other to the other? Yeah. And that's uh, I I was actually at first I did try to when I was doing my competition, I did try to write them down. It's in between like uh, training days, I have mm-hmm. recovery day. Like I was strict about recovery training, recovery training. Cause I knew like I had to do that if I wanted to get to where I needed to be. Yeah. Um, and on rest days, I'd be like, okay, well I have this mental image of these moves. So I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to go to the pole and test it out when I'm on a training day. Mm-hmm. And most of the time it didn't work out how I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> so I think while it can work, it's very, very difficult. It is super difficult. Um, The biggest way that writing it out helps, I think, is in the, in the like two, three, one structure where you can say, I want to hit this move. I want to hit this move and this move. Mm -hmm. And then I'll figure out how to get between those moves. Yeah. (laughs) And that's where the freestyling would come in. For sure. Um, when I was in San Francisco and it was competition season at the time, um, there were people who had full blown written out um, their choreo after they had already completely designed it, of course. But once mm-hmm. the, once they have designed it, in order to remember it and you know help them mentally walk through it, so assume they don't have a pole at home and they can only practice at the studio, which is most people's cases. Um, right. So they would mentally walk through it that way. So they would have like a period. It's like some people got really, really de- like detailed, which is amazing. Um, it would be like, this is the song time frame, and here's mm-hmm. the move I'm doing. And then here's the next move I'm doing and all this stuff. And so they would write it all down in such a detailed way to help themselves kind of remember it later on, like as you can mentally kind of go through your choreo obviously Mm -hmm. it's a bit different than physically doing it but it does help it keep it fresh in your mind like all right when i go to the pole the next time these are the things i need to do in this order yeah rehearse it even if you can't rehearse it physically (laughs) Uh, my cats are in and out of the video today (laughs) um and so the uh right for me when i I'm going to step back a long way. For me, I know a song is right for me and for whatever show or, you know, whatever I'm doing, whatever I need to make a choreo, a song is right for me if I start designing in my head. Mm. That song doesn't, I mean, most people are like this, but if that song doesn't make me want to design, want to be creative, then who cares? Like, not that song. I don't want to choose a song just because I have to. Um, you know, it, it has to be a certain length or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Which is kind of why I like performing shows over like doing competitions. Competitions have rules and 
I'm a squiggly wiggly worm that doesn't like all that many rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've definitely decided like I'm not a competition person. I'm a show person, but I'm not a competition person. <laughs> yeah. Give me some weird like show things. Be like, all right, we're super weird and everyone needs to have tentacles coming out of their nostrils. Cool. I can make that work. But like <laughs> hardcore constraints, um, like timing and stuff, like mm, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to cut something short if it needs to be longer in order to convey the message. Yeah. Um, um, another another piece of advice on songs is actually listen to it for like the second you know you're gonna have to pick a song, and you know the rules with what's all like time constraints, things like that. Uh, listen to it over and over and over again because you don't want to you want to make sure you don't get sick of that song oh, that's yeah. what happened to my first two songs I'm like this is a great song and I am still designing to it but I don't want to listen to it again if I have to hear this person <laughs> sing this line one more time I'm gonna lose my shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> um my uh, very first Vegas show was like that I chose uh earned it or earn it or whatever by um i think it's by the weekend i can't mm -hmm. listen to that song anymore without wanting to physically like just like rip my own hair out because yeah i just i hate it i hate it so many I, I i've heard it so many times doing it myself and it's also in the crazy girls show in vegas and uh so i i watch that way too many times with people coming to town <laughs> also because it's a bitchin show <laughs> uh, but I watched it way too many times. And so I heard the song so much that I was just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> mentally puke when you hear it. So yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why I was like, all right, when I pick a song, I listen to it for like a day straight. Yeah. Because if if your earworm is still there after like at least two to three days of choreoing to it, then you're probably going to be okay. Uh, yeah. But if by the end of like the first couple of days, you're like, if I have to hear this again, I'm going to die probably switch songs <laughs> yeah my initial pick was uh, gold digger by sar b and you know it was fine it was like uh <laughs> it was a song that i would listen to on my way to my studio which is like 25 minutes away okay. it was in my like playlist for driving there um and it was fine it's like yeah this sounds neat i like the i like the uh, instruments in it and i noticed like as i was choreography uh, uh, choreographing it I would hear it come on in my playlist on my way to the studio and I'd be like mm -mm, no Next. no skip 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 <laughs> and that's what I'm like maybe I shouldn't be choreographing this no <laughs> because not only are you going to you know not only do you have to listen to it a million times even if you're only performing the show live in front of people once um, mm -hmm. you know you're gonna record it hopefully yeah. you know unless you're one of those people that's like <laughs> eh, fuck it uh you know you're probably gonna record it and you're also going to um you know you're probably gonna show it to people and then you might put it on instagram or facebook or wherever right you're gonna hear that song once the show is over i promise yeah or or if it's like uh it's still in my my that song is still still in one of my poll playlists and I still really like it, but I can't stand it when it goes on, when it comes on. So I just skip it every time. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame. So you. even if you, even if you're not showing it to friends and family, uh, it's still going to exist. Oh, for sure. When you hear it come on somewhere that you can't change it, you're just like PTSD mm -hmm. flashbacks, kind of like I remember drafting <laughs> to this song in the war, like. It's, yeah it's wild so yeah music plays a huge <laughs> part in like designing your choreo obviously um and it's... i wound up yeah oh. i wound up going with a non-lyrical song and i was so happy i don't blame you <laughs> i have an entire playlist for songs that don't have lyrics just so that i am not influenced by what people are saying yeah the beats mm -hmm. are influencing but, you know, if, if there's a song and it's, you know, really sad and talking about losing someone or a breakup or, you know, something yeah. like that, th that's really heavily going to influence this, right? It's going to influence what I'm feeling. It's going to influence, you know, the style of dancing I'm doing. I'm not going to do Russian Exotic to a sad song, personally. If yeah. you're out there, kudos. <laughs> uh, but personally, that's not what I'm going to do. And so I have music that is 
a whole playlist of music with no lyrics because with those songs I can choose how I want to move without being extra influenced by words that are coming about. Yeah, because you can always interpret, most of the time you can always interpret uh, ambient music differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously going to be more upbeat or slower beat, but it might feel different depending on the day. And I mean, I know people who harness those lyrics, that energy that those lyrics give them and just run with it. And that's awesome. If you, if you find a song that does that, great. But if you're just trying to freestyle and dance, it's definitely going to influence what you're doing. Oh, for sure. Right. Because then, especially if it's a song you know, and again, like my song that I chose where the world keeps spinning, right? And so he says it multiple times in the song. So if I'm freestyling to that, I know he's about to say it. So I'll be like, oh, I'll spin with it. <laughs> yeah. I can only do that so many times before I lose it. <laughs> <laughs> so. This has been the portion of the show. We kind of went a little bit longer today, but pole (laughs) dancing, dancing, choreographing things, right, is pretty big part of the community. That's that's the whole reason that a lot of people learn tricks. Obviously, there's a more acrobatic community who wants to do, uh, you know, less like flowy dance stuff and more Mm -hmm. combinations of tricks. But those people still have to learn how to freestyle and put stuff together. Yeah, so, transitions are still important. Combinations are still important, and it all ties in together. Yeah, so whether you're going with music, without music, um, the way that you design how you're going to put your moves together is incredibly important. Very few people I know join pole dancing to learn one trick at a time and never string them together. <laughs> so It's true. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so the on the pole section is going to be slightly different today um i am going to it's this this is something you can do for yourself with the pole but off the pole so technically on the pole but not really um and so today i'm going to talk about uh which means destiny gets to do all these exercises with me uh, so <laughs> it'll be like one of those fun 90s workout videos yeah, where you have like the three extras <laughs> <laughs> Um, Those are fantastic. So uh, what I want to talk about today is caring for your hands, okay? Um, As someone who's taught and has gone to uh, many different studios over time, taking classes from many different instructors, almost always I do not see anybody taking care of their hands in a warm-up slash a cool-down, right? There is no care for hands. Mm -hmm. The most that I'll see is, like, people are like, all right, stretch your forearms and do some wrist circles or these, right? (laughs) That's the most that I see, and that's rare, Mm -hmm. right? That's rare. So I'm going to kind of talk about today what I make my students do as far as their hand care. No matter what you're doing in pole dancing, unless you're hanging upside down by like your toes or your legs or something, right? Most of pole dancing involves your hands. It's possible to do lots of tricks without them, but especially if you're a beginner, (laughs) you need these things to make it work. And even if you're going to no hand moves, you've still got to use your hands to get up there. So (laughs) (laughs) unless you're launching at the pole, in which case, good luck. Um, That sounds horrible. For me, personally, on a pain level. And so <laughs> you you need your hands. Your hands are super important. I have been, hold on, cat trying to enter into a bag he's not supposed to be in. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, my, within the first month of pole dancing, I was moved up from a level one to a level two, which is horrible. Not recommended unless that person is truly showing real progress. I was not, by the way. Oh, and so I was erroneously moved from a level one to a level two and injured my wrist. I strained the tendons in my wrist and could not use my right hand for 30 straight days. Um, Mm -hmm. That involved typing at my job. That involved, you know, brushing my teeth, my hair, trying to do anything. I couldn't do anything with my right hand. And I was banned from pole dancing by my studio because they were like, you're injured. Don't come in. If you come in, I'm going to kick your ass. So within my first 30 days of pole dancing, I injured myself and I injured, guess what? My hands. And Mm -hmm. ever since then, I've been super all about it and just been like, okay, we really need to like 
I need to figure out what I can do for myself to heal. But also when I started teaching, I was like, I need to integrate this in. I know people don't think about it, but we got to do it. Super important. (laughs) So a couple of things that I make my students do, right, are this is the most common one that you'll see people do. There's an addition that you should add to it, but be very gentle, right? So I'm interlace those fingers, right? And when you push them out, I'm going to scoot back a little bit. So when you push them out, guess what you're missing out on? Nothing's happening to your thumbs. They're just hanging out, right? Chilling like villains. So what I have my students do very gently so that you do not destroy the tendons in your thumb, you only warm them up and or cool them down, is very gently try to pick their thumbs up and touch their palms. This should feel terrible if you have, yep. It feels awful. Like, I feel like my my wrists are dying. <laughs> yes. You do this incredibly gently. I can touch up here to my pinky, but this is because I've been doing this exercise for a really long time. Yeah, like right here I get strained. <laughs> yeah, and that's where you stop, right? That's the perfect point to stop is where you feel just a little bit of that stretch. I have them do it like this because you're already stretching out all of those other fingers, right? You're using them to push back on but for here right it is pick up and down and pick up and down similarly you could do the same thing if you just want to do one hand at a time this is more of a forearm and then finger stretch Mm -hmm. you're pulling your fingers this way and then same thing you do the wiggle in this direction Right. Which this is also fantastic for like elbow tendonitis, which I had because I was erroneously uh, moved up <laughs> ahead of time. So. <laughs> right. And then obviously, because we're doing it on camera, we're going to do both sides. Even if you are doing it on camera, I will <laughs> haunt you if you do not do both sides. <laughs> right. So moving your thumb tendon is super important. As someone who has had a partner uh, tear their tendons in their thumb, you really want to move it and keep it alive, right? Right. If the wiggles, I call them the, the wiggles, just I don't know, that's just it. So even if the wiggles feel terrible, very gentle wiggles. You do not have to go crazy to the wall right, and try to get it here. Not everybody's hands do that. So just move it. Move those tendons. When you're holding onto the pole, you're holding onto it like this. If this goes away, most of the time, depending on your grip, you're probably going to fall off the pole. <laughs> right? Super important part that you don't think about until you heard it. For wrist. Wrist circles are obviously great, right? One, two, three, four, and then going the other way. Right? Wrist circles are good. The other thing to do, because this is a very active warm up, that's great. I see lots of people do that one in class. I'm happy that they're doing anything remotely close to that. The other thing to do is the cool down version, right? The cool down version is just gently like pulling them back a little bit. You can either pull or you can sit your hand on top and push your fingers down as well. So now it is a fingers wrist forearm all in one go as kind of a relaxer. Because most of the time our hands are like this, right? Destiny's still modeling. Most of the time our hands are like this and they're like, ah! So you want to open everything back up after the end of your session so that you can relax them. Relax, relax, Mm. relax. And since most of my day job involves typing, like I'm always like this. Which hands? Which hands? Dinosaur hands. And and this feels amazing. That's why I'm still doing it. It's like, please, I don't, I'm not going to stop. I uh, affectionately (laughs) refer to this one as the angry ducky because it makes like a little duck face. Quack, quack, quack. Um, it takes it. everything I have not to quack at my students like an insane person, but I do it sometimes <laughs> anyway, depending on the group. Okay, hands are going this way because most of the time we do hands curled in. If you're doing like handstands and stuff, really intensive on your wrist going that way, obviously go the other direction, right? This feels really silly because you're like, oh, I could just fold my hand any day. Really like actively push from above the fingers not your fingers because that's not going to do you any good from above your fingers at your knuckles so that your hand does get a little bit there are some people who can like really turn it those people are crazy and amazing i can't do that (laughs) but you do want to press so essentially it is whatever you've strained yourself doing the most in class so whether it's you're going like this curling in or this pushing out you want to do the opposite right that's pretty standard 
is whatever you really hurt yourself on, try to bend and counteract that. The other thing I make people do for fingers as a warm up mm -hmm. is play the piano on a part of their body. So I'm gonna use my uh, I'm gonna use my chest right here, and so fingers actively warming up is you know play the piano, right? Incorporate the thumb. Do not let it hang out, right? This is just to actively use them, warm them up. You can obviously do this right on um, like your legs, your chest, uh, your belly. You can do it. I don't know how you would manage this one on the pole, but you can also do it on a wall. The other thing to do is to go the other direction. So normally when I, when you think about playing the piano, you start pinky, ring, middle, pointer, thumb. You have to go the other way, which gets really weird. So thumb, pointer, middle, ring, pinky. <laughs> <laughs> I almost did not make that out correctly, right? I keep on missing like yes. one finger. <laughs> You're going to miss it, at least a few of them. So this is something that I make them do as an active warm up, right? To get all of their fingers working in tandem. Most of the time, our hands are going all in one go, right? If I'm moving, I'm gripping like this. Very rarely is it just a couple of fingers in one way, unless you're maybe like doing like a... Uh, Funky, funky grip, grip. yeah. Funky, funky grip. grip. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so if you're doing funky grip, you may like split your hands here or split your hands here, right? But most mm. of the time your fingers are going in one direction. I mean, even in cup grip, like it's still bent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So moving them kind of one at a time keeps that ability going. So you're not like, well, all my hands do is this. Okay. The last one that I do for wrist tendons is, um, there's two versions of it, and it also involves this thumb. Yay, everyone loves their thumb tendon after I made you do the wiggles. I'm sure you do. So stretchy right here. Oh, me? <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 just like, I, I still feel it, like oh. right here. <laughs> um, the other thing I make my people do, I also did this as a little bit of rehab on my hand. Not a doctor. This does not mean you can do it if you have a wrist injury. Talk to your doctors for sure. Not a doctor. Um, <laughs> but it's something I make people do as far as warm up, especially with our thumb. So the, the first one's really easy, right? It is hands out flat, pinky thumb together, flat, ring, flat, middle, flat, pointer, flat, right? I make you do it on both hands you know, a couple of rounds in each direction. Okay, right, so boop, 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 boop. You have to extend. The other version that will help with the thumb in particular is now you leave all of your fingers straight and you don't move them. You go thumb to pinky, away. Thumb to ring, see how I've already moved my hand? <laughs> away. so difficult. <laughs> ah, thumb to middle, watch <laughs> Thumb to the side. Thumb to the side. This one, your pointer finger is going to be real easy, right? Because you're just like, oh, yeah. ah. <laughs> the hardest one comes from, the, this one for me is the hardest because my mm -hmm. hand like folds. You can see my hand fold in on itself. So <laughs> when I tried to walk through these exercises, I'm like, one, two, three. And then obviously the one in the middle is not so bad. But with little that mini one, finger reps. Yeah, little mini <laughs> finger reps. It's like little tiny finger push-ups. Um, <laughs> right, so moving that thumb actively outwards, right? You can't just be like, well, I did it. Don't do that. I'll haunt you, I swear. Call me out. <laughs> well, no, no. Actively, one and two, three and four, five and six, seven and eight. And this will help you open up this thumb rather than you know, having your fingers like co completely contortioned backwards, right? And then like trying to wiggle your thumb in that manner, right? So start with these, move to these. <laughs> this is your last section, right? The other one, this is the very last one that I do for, uh, uh, for finger stretching on, with my crew. Um, this one's not so bad for some people, most people give me the eyebrows because like at this point when I teach class, obviously everyone's wearing a mask now. So all I can see is people's eyebrows. That's the only thing I have <laughs> that tells me whether they're cursing me under their mask or not because they're not saying anything. They're focused. But if the eyebrows are like, then I know that like they're not having a good time on the wiggles. The wiggles is the one that will mess everybody up. This one, not so bad. Most people don't complain <laughs> about it, but this will get people complaining nonstop. Mm -hmm. 
Last one that I do is um, I kind of, I'm going to have to prop myself up a little bit higher. Yay for being relatively short. So I take my hands kind of a little <laughs> bit lower than my elbows and I take all of my fingers and press them to the side and up. Oh, to the side and up. Try not to move the elbows in this. Well. What is that finger flexibility desk? <laughs> <laughs> those I don't are, know what you're talking about. Those are straight up at a right angle. <laughs> it it sucks on the right side though. Like my okay. left side's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Neither of my sides look like that at all, which is fine, by the way. <laughs> right. This is another one of those uh fingers, wrist, forearm stretches all in one go. Right. Not wrist stretches on like circle circles. But it is this, but more active, right? And you're going mm -hmm. in both directions, right? So you're actively pressing the fingers forward, 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 forward. Okay? My pinky always wants to go boop. Yeah, pinky is <laughs> like, get out of here. So <laughs> hands is something that I personally have, you know, um, uh, an attachment to when I warm up. I've, it's the last thing I warm up because it is obviously the most important. I need my hands to hold on to the pole for everything. Um, they're the last things that I warm up because it's the one that I know I need to have like ready to go. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm doing a couple of spins that day and I do, you know, I do like basic like a down dog and a forward fold and some lunges. Like my legs aren't gonna die, but <laughs> no matter what I'm doing, I need my hands. So. Hands is the last like five minutes of my warm up straight up, um, just because it's so important. And yeah. if I sit and do this all day, <laughs> just this motion with my hands, uh, I talk with my hands a lot. <laughs> uh, so if I sit and do this all day or type all day, my hands are kind of like in these dinosaur things. So when I get done with my day at working, I flatten out and press, right? And then mm -hmm. I wiggle my thumbs, especially when I'm in class, just to make sure that those tendons are alive, they're warm, I don't want to tear anything. I definitely don't want to hurt my wrist again because I just flung my microphone 70 feet off my face. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I don't want to hurt my wrist again because I still have two different variations in flexibility in my right versus my left wrist, and my right wrist is the one that I entered. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're getting closer, and it's been almost three years, so... <laughs> The tendon injuries are fun like that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So, and I, you'll never believe what grip I entered it in. Is that funky grip? No, I entered it in full split grip or uh, oh, full bracket. That was my, that was my second guess because that is how I injured my elbow. <laughs> exactly that grip. I refuse in the to, air. <laughs> yes. I refuse to teach that grip to uh, anybody that is not <clears throat> upper level with calluses and actual strength. Yeah, and that is the number one reason why it is in our intermediate section in the move dictionary. Absolutely. Because beginners can start warming up and building up the strength in the forearms and shoulders, but actually doing the grip is something very different. <laughs> super, super different. Um, so that's kind of going to be it for our on the pole section. I know it's not technically on the pole, but today I felt the need to kind of cover um this section where you work with your hands and you make sure that you are actively keeping them happy right they are the gateways to the pole um for most people right i'm sure there are ways to get around that if you don't have hands like there's ways to you know pull without them but for the most part right your hands are the gateways of the pole world it's how do you get on the pole off the pole transition all these things they're super helpful you really don't want any of them to be injured so, yeah. <laughs> you know, you need to take care of them. Active warm-ups, right? So active warm-ups are pianos and then wiggle like this and then wiggle like that. And then active cool-downs, right, where you're pressing in the way that you have not been bending them the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. um, quick update from Des and I on the move dictionary. Destiny? Yeah. Um... So at the beginning of the year, I kind of sent out a newsletter of like, hey guys, October is going to be a little bit slow. Uh, our newsletter has doubled since then. So I feel it's probably a good idea to make that announcement again. <laughs> um, October is going to be a little bit slow because I will be away from uh, out of commission a little bit getting married. Hooray! Yay, happy! Congratulations. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a super small gathering because COVID and I'm not going to be 
uh, dumb about it, but <laughs> uh, so just just parents, everybody's getting negative COVID tests. We're still going to social distance and we're just live streaming it to all of our actual guest list and friends and family and <laughs> um, hello bear in the background. Hello bear cleaning himself. Thanks for making this an X-rated show. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, but that just means that Polkidia is going to be seeing a slowdown in articles that are published in the month of October. The Move Dictionary is still going to continue because the lovely Kim Kita is going to be still publishing and presenting those moves mm -hmm. throughout the month. We're going to be doing two to three uh, each week, the same as usual schedule. So that's still ongoing and that's going to be going pretty much indefinitely. <laughs> until we at run least out of until moves. mid November, yeah, <laughs> or mid December, I think is how many moves we have, <laughs> which it's a lot. Um, there's a couple of grips, like static grips, that we have from our previous grip guide that's going in, but there's still a lot of great moves like ballerina spin, uh, wide fireman. So, a couple of beginner things, a couple of intermediate things, and a couple of advanced things, which is a new addition to the move dictionary. Yeah. Um, so while things are slowing down and we're helping to celebrate the show, will obviously be me, just me at some point, which is fine. I have plenty of topics to talk and face <laughs> off about in the pole world, because if there's one thing that I can talk about nonstop forever, it's pole dancing. The other one is cats, obviously. Um, and so... Uh, so it'll be me on the show on my own for a little bit. Um, you know, I'll be popping in and out of like the Facebook groups and things of that nature in order to check on everybody. And uh, the other thing you might notice inside of the move dictionary is change in location. I unfortunately did lose my retail space as my studio here where I'm at. Um, and so you'll notice a change in location after December. <laughs> That's the yeah. backlog. Uh, you'll notice a change in location after December. I am most likely going to um, be taking my stage poles with me, my uh, loop it poles that I am extremely attached to. Uh, loop it poles <laughs> with me to other people who are uh, allow me to rent out their studio so that I have a clean and appropriate space to film in for everybody. That mm -hmm. way there's no distractions um, in the environment like my lovely kitties, who I love very much, but also very distracting. <laughs> um, right. That way there's no distractions. It's a nice, clean environment for you to learn from. So it will be slightly different because I'll probably be on my stage pole. Um, but other than that, it's just going to be a change in location. So don't worry. Uh, up until December, you'll see the regular uh, situation. And then after all of those moves get posted, we'll move on to something new. Mm, sounds absolutely fantastic. And I'm glad that we can continue, even though the unfortunate loss of the studio. That's uh, okay. I'm in <laughs> California, if you weren't aware. And we are constantly on that. Are we inside or outside roller coaster? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is a horrible roller coaster and i'm sure that you went off <laughs> i would love to get off of this roller coaster just like ah uh, so all right everybody thank you for tuning in if you're on youtube drop us some comments let us know how you feel about those wiggle finger warm-ups if you hate them or love them if they're new to you right Tell me how you feel about them. And also, uh, congratulations to Destiny. You better wish her congratulations, people. <laughs> uh, and then last thing is, if you've got <laughs> anything about how you design choreo, something we didn't talk about, let us know. Right? Okay. Have a lovely day, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.